In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. In our first reading today, we had quite the scene put forward for us. Samuel, the last of the great judges, the first of the great prophets, came to Bethlehem to anoint anoint a new king for Israel. And all the community was gathered about. They had all sanctified themselves for a sacrifice. And Samuel commanded Jesse to have his sons pass by him one at a time. And when the eldest, Eliab, came by, Samuel thought to himself, oh, wow, this has got to be him. He was big and he was strong and he was handsome. And God says to Samuel, No, this isn't the one. He said, you look at people the way other people look at people, but God looks at the heart, not the outward appearance. And so, as of course as the story went on, seven of Jesse's sons passed by. None of them were chosen, and finally Jesse... uh, Samuel had to ask Jesse, do you have another son? Well, yeah, the youngest, he's out watching the sheep. And Samuel stops the whole ceremony. You can imagine. <laughs> Send for him. We're not going to do anything till he comes back. That, you know, they didn't have cars or street cars or that bullet trains or anything. They had to wait for somebody to go out to the, sheep, to the fields where the sheep were, get David and bring him back. And yet, but here when this... Young but handsome boy comes in. God says to Samuel, anoint him, he's the one. Now that's quite the scene. There's also, it projects for us this question, how do we see the way God sees? Even Samuel, the great prophet, had a bit of a problem with it, although he could do it. Abraham Heschel, the great Jewish theologian and philosopher, suggested that what the prophets were able to do was not so much exactly see the world through God's eyes, but that they felt the world the way God saw it. What he, called it, what he said was they were connected to the pathos of God. That's what he called it. And that when they looked with their own eyes, they were overwhelmed with how God saw it, with what God was doing. And hence, you get these really powerful oracles where they could actually say, thus says the Lord God, and deliver a message as God would see and understand the world. But of course, it's not that far. It's just been recently that we did did Pentecost. Now, on Pentecost, remember, Peter got up and he said, this is what the prophets have long uh, said would happen, that God has poured out his spirit upon all flesh. Your old men will see visions, your young men will dream dreams, uh, and everyone will prophesy. Well, do we? It seems like I'm not so sure. But then we hear today in Paul's um, second reading second letter to the Corinthians, he says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Boy, that sounds really positive, doesn't it? And it almost sounds like there's something magic that happens when we're baptized, that uh, all of a sudden we see the world the way God sees it and everything is new. Sounds good, doesn't it? But of course, if that were the case, Paul would not have needed to write that letter to the Corinthians. They would have seen it for themselves. What he really was saying is, now in Christ, we can see the world the way God sees it, 
and everything can become new. But it doesn't happen automatically. Think about the church in Corinth, what we know about it. It was a mess. There were people who were rich and wealthy and who were eating well and didn't pay much attention to the people in the church who were poor and hungry. That doesn't sound like Christ. There were people who uh, were arguing who was more important based on um, who baptized them or what their um, spiritual gifts were. That doesn't sound particularly like Christ. So all these people in the church in Corinth had been baptized, but what Paul was trying to bring to the point to their attention is they had not changed the way they saw the world, and they had therefore had not changed the way they behaved in the world. They were still operating under the old rules. And we know what these rules are. They're still around today and they still operate the way the world operates. You know, bigger is better, uh, rich is better than poor, uh, stronger is better, faster. Uh, and we end up having a world of winners and losers. And you know, we can look around today and say that's still pretty much the way the world is operating. In fact, it's kind of distressing today because what we see primarily is a world with just a few winners and a whole lot of losers and it's a hard world now I want to say one thing about winning and losing when we're talking about life it's not a good thing there are places where that's appropriate I am for example I live in Kansas City I root for the Royals there's nothing wrong with that, even when they lose to St. Louis. But I know full well that God does not care whether Kansas City or St. Louis wins those games. It's, you know, sports or other things are fine, but when it comes to life, God does care. Because the world is going to create winners and losers, whether we like it or not. But what God calls us to do is to care for everyone, not just the winners, but especially the losers. That those are the people we want to love and care for and see that they are adequately given food and shelter and warmth and all the things that they need. That's the world we are supposed to live into. What Paul is really telling us is that we need essentially like a set of glasses with which to see the world. And those lenses are the cross and the resurrection. Remember in the cross, Jesus forgave even the people who were killing him. He never rejected, he never hated anyone. He embraced the whole world on the cross. We even say that. We'll say that in the Eucharistic prayer. He stretched out his arms on the cross to bring everyone within the reach of his saving embrace. So there is no one in the world who's bad enough that through Jesus' eyes we're allowed to hate or to dislike or to pass off as not worthy enough. No one. And by the same token, the resurrection, that lens, tells us that what we see in this life is not everything that there is. In fact, Paul said that just in the reading we had last week, which came just before this one. He says, the things that are seen are only temporary. And the things that are not seen are eternal. And in those are the things we hope for. Those are the things that we live into those things, the eternal things in Christ. When we put on those lenses, the lens of the cross and the lens of the resurrection, then we can see that we have the ability to look at the world in a different way. That even if things by following God's way don't work out wonderfully for us right now, there's a longer game. And in that longer view, what 
is most important is our love for God, which is reflected in our love for each other. That may be the hardest thing, I think, for any of us to do now. We live in a world that tends not to look past, at least at the most, the next quarterly results, and sometimes just the next day, or the next hour or minute. But to look into eternity is what allows us to actually see the new creation that God has provided for us. In those lenses, everything has become new. There is nothing broken or sick or evil that cannot be renewed, restored, and redeemed in Christ. That's the great hope in which we live. When we establish those lenses to look at the world, it is new. We can be the people of God, and we will live into all of God's promises. Amen.